Our United Way Spotlight is on the Sexual Assault Crisis Center, and I'm joined by Miriam Pandy, Executive Director. Thank you so much for being with us today, Miriam. Thank you so much for having me, Donna. So tell me an overall what the Sexual Assault Center does, and then we'll get into some of the changes that, that you've made in the last year. Oh yeah, for sure. So um, Sexual Assault Center Kingston, or SAC as we call it, is a um, nonprofit organization providing free, confidential, and non-judgmental support to survivors of sexual violence of 12 years and older uh, of all genders. And this includes a support for historical sexual violence, as well as recent sexual violence, if folks have experienced that. So our overall like kind of um, role within the community and how we support survivors is through, I would say, three of our broad mandates. Um, so first of all, we support uh, survivors and their loved ones through to heal from sexual violence through counseling support. Um, we also have a very active role in the community uh, through education and uh, providing um, educational opportunities for folks to learn about sexual violence. And then we also organize and advocate for systematic and social change required to actually end sexual violence in our communities. Okay, now, is it possible that someone could be a victim of sexual violence and not even realize that they were? That maybe it happened a long time ago. Maybe they said, well, it happened to everybody, so it was no big deal. But in fact, yeah. it was sexual violence. So, do you ever get into that? Yes, we do. So, as you can imagine, there's a lot of stigma around, you know, disclosing experiences of sexual violence, and um, you know, um, that is how like our patriotic systems usually benefit from silencing survivors and you know, creating a space where people think that sexual violence is normalized, and that's part of the role we try to uh, play in the community to educate folks about different instances of sexual violence and that the fact that, you know, survivors might, might have different experiences and it is up to them to kind of identify themselves and, you know, no um, act of sexual violence is okay and no act of sexual violence is normal. So that is one of the roles we usually try to play and, you know, raise awareness around that, uh, you know, yeah, some of right. those. Right, uh, you didn't ask for it as they used to say. Um, is it, is sexual violence always a physical thing? No, not at all. Um, uh, it could be, you know, an emotional sexual, uh, you know, an experience of emotional sexual violence, or it could be physical. I think a lot of times we, um, more folks um, are, like, it's easier for more folks to identify sexual violence when it's a, an act of physical sexual violence, but not at all. It can come in all forms, spiritual, uh, emotional, and, as well as um, physical. Can, can you give me an idea of, I'm not clear on what uh, emotional sexual violence is. I, I'm just not clear on what that is. So for example, cyber sexual violence, right? Like you, okay. you are on, like, you can see that on the dating apps. You can see that, you know, on, you know, uh, the virtual environment that so much of our time is now spent on. There's a lot of, you know, um, inappropriate content inappropriate, uh, you know, acts of sexual violence happening in our virtual world, or, you know, you could be, um, you could be, you know, not the victim of a sexual violence yourself, but like observe that something happens to somebody else so that that also can have an effect on you. So it, it has a very, you know, wide range of experiences, emotional, as I said, spiritual, as well as physical. Okay, thank you for explaining that to me. And I understand that you're branching out into areas that, uh, well, I, I didn't realize, like diversity, tell me about that. Yeah, so uh, at SAC, we have had a long-standing Indigenous program um, where, you know, we do have like an Indigenous counselor who provides education, outreach, as well as individual counseling support to uh, from um, an Indigenous um, perspective. And so most recently, I would say in the next eight months or so, we started our Diverse Communities program, where through which we provide individual counseling support, as well as outreach and education to folks identifying 
saying uh, as belonging to racialized uh, immigrant, newcomer and refugee communities. We understand that COVID has made it, you know, has made a disproportionate effect on these communities. And we know that a lot of these communities do not have the pro appropriate supports in, in the system to be able to, you know, access. And so we wanted to take a step towards, you know, bridging some of those gaps. And so this is a very new program, but we're really excited about it. What are you finding is different about, say, someone coming from another country, an immigrant, a, a refugee? Is, is their experience different than, than would be for someone like me who's born and raised in, in Ontario? Um, that, uh, that, I would say, it d differs on an individual basis. But, for example, some of the barriers for folks, uh, you know, new to Canada, if they have language barriers, for example, it is very hard to, you know, receive services that, you know, kind of uh, provide that, you know, translation support. If you are not from, uh, you know, a Western, you didn't, you weren't born and raised in like a Western kind of society, uh, you might have values and cultural differences that uh, somehow are looked over or, or are not, you know, taken into account when you are given a direct service. So all of those pieces make it different. Um, and then, you know, issues of status, permanent residency, citizenship, what you're, you know, able to get because of, you know, issues of status, what you're able to access, um, as well as, you know, financial pieces, financial support that is there for, you know, um, find specific financial challenges that like some new folks to the country might be experiencing. But they, then again, it can differ from person to person. It can differ from community to community. But we know that there are extra barriers as well as, you know, racism and um, that people face in the system that can, you know, you go and want to like access social service supports in the system, but then you are uh, confronted with like a lot of times instances of racism and, you know, um, that doesn't make it easier. It makes it harder for you to be able to, you know, um, access the supports you need. And I kind of think in some cultures, it, it's something you don't talk about such things. It's it's kept in the family. It's a family thing. It's a, you don't want to talk about it. We're a little more open about it, especially now. We didn't used to be, but I, I always get that sense that it's something you don't talk about. It's it's embarrassing. It's Have you run into that with, with new Canadians? Um, I, I would say, again, it differs. It differs from culture to culture. We don't want to generalize, uh, you know, experiences of folks who experience sexual violence from different communities. And that is another, you know, um, I would say, you know, stigma we have to, like, confront that, you know, there are notions of those communities within the Western uh, society that we want to make sure that, you know, we're not um, generalizing. Obviously, uh, there are communities uh, that, you know, experience that more than others. But again, that really, you know, it, it, it depends on your individual circumstances and, you know, uh, the community you're from. Okay, just that much tougher for, for new Canadians than it is for the rest of us. I understand the United Way has played a big part in your success. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, so um, we do uh, receive funding from United Way uh, for like a couple of different services that we offer. So I think our long standing relationship with United Way started when they start, uh, started funding our youth programs. So as you can imagine, there's just so much support we can offer. A lot of times we had, uh, you know, we used to have long wait lists for survivors uh, who had to wait until they can get access to service. and. Uh, you know, when it comes to youth, like uh, a few months wait can make all the difference on how that youth is able to access support and kind of uh, start their healing journey. And that can make a huge impact on the trajectory uh, of their life, right? So uh, with funding from United Way, we were able to structure our youth program. So all of uh, youth are able to kind of skip our wait lists and be connected to services right away, which makes a huge impact on, you know, the trajectory of their healing journey. And then uh, more recently, United Way started, started funding us to kind of support us in eliminating and reducing our wait list. So before that funding, I think in 2018, we, we had instances of like folks waiting for supports for like five to six months. Mm -hmm. And then with, uh, you know, funding coming from United Way, we were able to reduce that wait list significantly, which, you know, uh, again, um, it wouldn't have been possible. And it, uh, it does have a big impact on the trajectory of survival. So lots of good reasons to support the United Way. Thank you so much for being with us today. Of course. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Donna.